So welcome everyone to our BioEngine platform. This is our 10th webinar in the series. And today we have a great pioneer scientist in hybrid rice, uh, rice research, Dr. Jahar, La, Jah, Jahar Ali uh, from the Erie Philippines. Uh, Jacinta will introduce him. Neha uh, is, will be co-host uh, this Zoom platform and shut it out the questions. Uh, and the attendees reply. Shoma will help us to in interview to Ali said, and uh, I'm request all of you, if you have any question related to today's box, please clearly mention in YouTube chat box and here the question answer box in the Zoom. It's specific and related to today's work, today's topic only. Those are the young, younger and young uh, viewers. I'm request all of you don't anxious about your certificate and password. This will be provided at the end of the talk. And I'm assured you all are getting this link and password. So please don't comment in from the very beginning. It's, it's create very difficult to pick up the right question for the talk. So be patient, we will give it to at the end of this talk. Uh, I'm, I must thank you to Jar sir for uh, accepting our invitation. It is a very new platform and it um, it's means to a, a lot to us. I also thanks to IRI, thanks to their hybrid rice platform. They promoted this talk very well. I'm also very thankful to Global Plant Council. They also promoted this talk and we got so many, uh, uh, so many registrations and so many uh, excited plant scientists and plant biologists. So I request Jacinta to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Rivo. Uh, welcome to today's webinar organized by BioEngine. BioEngine is a nonprofit organization created to promote plant research worldwide. The seminar series has been designed to build a platform from where plant scientists can present their research to the world. We hope future scientists can gain perspective and inspiration by listening to the esteemed plant researchers talk about their scientific accomplishments and their thoughts on the future of plant science. We are grateful that many renowned scientists have accepted our invitation to share their research insights with us. We have had a huge response of more than 5,000 registrations for today's webinar. We are thankful to the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines for sharing and promoting today's webinar all over social media. We're also thankful to the Global Plant Council for their encouragement uh, for promoting today's webinar on their platform and social media. Uh, we also welcome the audience and thank them for their interest in the bioengine webinars. It is our request to all viewers to please hold all questions for the question and answer round at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions related to today's talk in the Zoom Q&A box or in the YouTube comment box. You can apply for a certificate of attendance via the feedback link and the password will be provided after the presentation. Submission for the feedback form is mandatory to receive a certificate. Today's topic, uh, for the webinar is Climate Smart Rice Hybrids by Dr. Jauha Ali, a senior scientist at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. Dr. Ali, a, rice hybrid breed, uh, a hybrid rice breeder, is a pioneer in his field of research. He has significantly contributed to the development of multiple stress tolerant, tolerant inbred and hybrid varieties and capacity building for strengthening global agricultural research. He has developed and characterized eight thermosensitive genic male sterile TGMS rice lines, for which he was awarded the Jawaharlal Nehru Award for Outstanding PhD Thesis Research work in 1994. This work led to the discovery of the genetics of the TGMS gene and to the understanding that TG genes, uh, TMS4 and TMS8, were unique and could be exploited. Using these materials led to the development of several TGMS-based hybrids uh, involving different centers. 
Currently, Dr. Ali has taken up two-line hybrid rice breeding at Erie on a strong footing to deliver the two-line hybrid rice technology in Asia. He has developed several low critical sterility temperature point TGMS lines that are currently in the verge of commercial exploitation. Also, he has been instrumental to the development of the green super rice breeding technology at Erie, being the project leader and the regional coordinator of the green super rice GSR project in Asia and Eastern and Southern Africa. Through, his, through this innovative approach, he has bred and released 26 rice varieties in Asia and nominated nearly 104 GSR cultivars into national cooperative yield trials. He connects genomic resources and tools to breed superior, high yielding, multiple stress resistant rice varieties and hybrids. As lead and regional coordinator, Dr. Jauha Ali leads the development and targeting of improved rice materials through systematic testing, adaptive trials and varietal release for eight countries in Asia and five in Eastern and Southern Africa. 56 GSR inbreds and 22 hybrids have been released, whereas 110 are nominated for national yield trials in different countries. Dr. Ali has also established the Erie GSR breeding front in 2009 and produced more than 530 promising multiple stress tolerant materials shared with Nara's part partners, Inja and Met. He has published more than 80 peer reviewed publications. He has also provided training to more than 2,100 researchers, especially on hybrid rice technology, seed production and molecular breeding. I now request Dr. Ali to begin his talk. Uh, if you could please share your screen with us. Thank you. Uh, good day to all of you in whichever time zones you are on. And I would first thank uh, Subroto for uh, organizing this event under the BioEngine platform with uh, his, uh, and I, I really, they deserve uh, congratulations for doing such a wonderful task uh, in a global, uh, global uh, scale and uh, bringing the science to the scientific masses and it, uh, at, uh, at no cost especially in this COVID times. I think this is uh, exactly the reason we should congratulate all of us, uh, Shuvo and his team. And uh, with that, let me uh, begin my talk on strengthening global food security through climate smart rice hybrids. If you look at the uh, food security, rather we should look at the food insecurity in the first place in order to do something for the food security. Food insecurity map uh, published uh, uh, recently, where it shows the uh, current levels of food insecurity in many countries in Africa and Asia are in light orange color, which shows the food security insecurities are very high. But the situation still goes worse when the global population would be something like 9.7 billion people in 2050. And if you look at the map at that time, it will be something like a very dark orange red, which is a signal that we are heading towards that. And among them, the conditions under which we are going to raise this, uh, uh, the food insecurity challenge, uh, meet this challenge, we will be under climate change. And among the stresses, if you look at the drought is, picking up like anything. And that means heat and drought would be the major factors that would determine how agriculture would survive, uh, especially the, the most affected would be crop plants and the livestock. So this is a really a challenge that is uh, coming uh, in the coming days. Now, securing the food under climate change is very, very important. 
Uh, and there are four elements, the key elements, uh, there are plenty of them, but I listed here four important elements out here. The first one is basically the core in ingredient that is the climate resilient crop varieties and hybrids. This is not only for rice crop, but for any variety, for any crop, uh, across crops, food crops, uh, it is applicable. And where we need to enhance the yield potential under both favorable and unfavorable environments. And the same uh, thing can be realized. These hybrids and these uh, varieties gets well expressed if your crop management technologies are properly associated with it and uh, properly uh, uh, advanced to the, uh, the farming communities. And the other side of the coin is also when you talk about food security, we have to talk about the nutritional security as well. And this is uh, basically comes uh, when uh, we have to use biofortification uh, approaches and especially for uh, food as uh, insecure and chronic regions of the world. And above all this, the conducive policies and action plans across the, uh, the, the policymakers in different countries to keep the food reachable at all, to all at all times. And that means the food availability, its access, affordability, its utilization and stability plays a very, very important role in the food security uh, plan. And in this picture, the hybridized technology is a very vital picture. We have to understand the context here. If you have to sustain the higher yields and grain quality, hybrid technology is very, very suited for this kind of situation. And in many countries where food security is a concern, where limited land is there, there is the best option is to switch to hybrid technology, uh, whether it is for rice or even for other crops as well, where the per unit area productivity would be increased. And coming to the self-sufficiency in rice production, uh, many countries have to keep their bowls filled. The, at times when you remember uh, when we had the food crisis in 2008, Many countries were uh, suffering from the uh, food, uh, food were not in the shelves. And, uh, and many of the countries uh, closed their export gates, including India and uh, uh, countries like Thailand and Vietnam and all these countries. But, uh, and that's the reason why self-sufficiency in many parts of the world is a, a very important as far as food is concerned. A hybrid technology, uh, when you uh, grow hybrids, it gives about 25 to 30% yield advantage. That means it frees up the land to other crops and other uh, important uh, 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 utilization of the land. If the, the inputs and the irrigation water is saved uh, about 25 to 30% in the same proportion. And the technology not only, it generates a lot of rural employment and seed industry. If you take a typical example of Hyderabad, uh, the surrounding areas of Hyderabad where the hybrid technology is uh, one of the hot centers in India, you see the rural employment uh, in those uh, villages. If you go around, people are well-versed how to do seed production and they are uh, uh, very good in managing those technologies very well. Now coming to uh, uh, the less dependence on rice imports. Many of the countries, if they have to reduce their uh, dependence on the imports, then uh, the best option again would be hybrid technology. And especially when you compare with wheat, wheat has surplus of rice, uh, wheat available in the international market. But uh, if you look at the rice, it's somewhere between, uh, it fluctuates between 25 million tons to 40 million tons in the international market. And countries like China and India, whenever there is any crisis, they will mop up all this uh, 25 to 30 million tons in no time and leaving many countries uh, without any food. So in the coming days, uh, this, uh, this phenomena would really uh, would be of major concern. So people at different levels at different uh, uh, countries, uh, they have to look how they can become less dependent on the rice imports. And of course, the, it nurtures the seed industry to produce quality seeds, not only for rice, but also other crops. And the quality seeds is the best uh, method to deliver uh, the good uh, productivity and increased production in any country. Now, if you look at this map, uh, the, the, the graph, uh, you see the, uh, the, the area outside uh, 
hybridized uh, spreading across outside China is al almost now 8 million hectares outside China. And this is uh, the potential of this growth in South Asia uh, would go up to 15 million hectares, whereas in South Asia, uh, especially Myanmar, uh, would be around 5 million hectares. Uh, and the current area in China is around 16 million hectares. So this is the, uh, the trajectory that we would expect in the coming days in order to feed the, the uh, to meet the requirement of the extra food that is required as far as rice is concerned. Now, if you look at the, uh, the four uh, research challenges for hybrid breeding, uh, the first and foremost is the increasing the grain yield heterosis. Can we increase the yield heterosis beyond 25%? Uh, that would attract the stability, that kind of stability would attract the farmers to adopt hybridized technology. Then the question comes is, can we breed multi-stress breeding for developing the parental lines uh, that would match the market needs in the region? And coming to the uh, consumer and grain quality for the uh, market uh, of the target regions uh, is very, very important. Uh, many times we always associate grain quality with uh, especially of the hybrids in relation to the, the Chinese food requirements where they prefer sticky uh, rices. So immediately the connotation goes that hybrids are sticky. It's not so. Basmati hybrids have been created and they have been uh, catered to the needs. So we can cater to any particular need, any kind of quality is possible through hybrid technology. And then if you look at the, the new technologies that are coming with the precision breeding approaches, uh, utilizing the informatics on genomics, high throughput, phenotyping and environments, all this can be combined to create the precision breeding for hybrids as well. And the genomic predictions and artificial intelligence and uh, to, to, uh, to identify uh, heterotic combinations by this approach is feasible now. It's not in the past that it were not feasible, but now it's very feasible. And we, many uh, uh, countries are looking at this as a big opportunity out here. And the high outcrossing trait uh, breeding, especially would increase the seed reproducibility. So uh, including ERI, we are working on this particular uh, topic. And this is one of the biggest challenges. If we can increase the hybrid seed reproducibility beyond three tons per hectare, that means we can bring down the cost of the seed so that the farmers can adopt at lower cost of seeds. Uh, coming to uh, the re reducing cost of hybrid seeds, we can go to another level of uh, introducing the two-line hybrid technology where the heterosis per se also increases. And uh, the, the key element out here is, can we get low CSP or low critical sterility point temp uh, temperature point uh, parental lines below 24 degrees centigrade? Now, to give a context to this, uh, what is the, uh, the current levels of uh, the yield that we saw in our multi-replicated trials, MRYT trials in the HRDC platform? We see uh, that in recent times, we see the increased, uh, 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 the increased uh, uh, the heterosis over the best check PSBRC82. We see about 30%. And this is exactly we saw in our, uh, even in our, uh, actual trials uh, on the socioeconomic trials uh, conducted at, at uh, in the Philippines, we see the similar number of 30% uh, advantage of the uh, hybrids over inbreds. And I, I know that many would appreciate that this is the current level is between 25 to 30% yield advantage of the hybrids over inbreds. Now, looking at the, the different market segments, and uh, we see the uh, the the South Asia, Bangladesh, and India, and we, we see the medium slender uh, grain segment and mid-early segment, and in India, mid-early segment. And you see the potential area uh, uh, that is, uh, that you see about uh, 8 million hectares. And the yield advantages that is required in this, uh, uh, if you look at the benchmark, uh, is around uh, five, eight to ten percent over the existing best hybrid, and over the the Czech hybrids is about again twenty. But if we are targeting around twenty-five to thirty percent in our uh, screening approach, 
And if you look at the key gaps that are presently in Indian context, where lack of stress tolerant materials, producibility, uh, the seed reproducibility, lodging, and false smut are some of the key traits. Likewise, in Bangladesh, the cold and disease resistance, including drought and salinity tolerances. So the same uh, market needs that are required in Philippines and Indonesia is also very important. Like in Indonesia, where the uh, BPH uh, with rugged stent virus and BLB and blast and drought are very important to close the gaps. And likewise, for uh, Philippines, we have multiple uh, abiotic and biotic stress tolerances is required. And much of this is also on the grain quality, uh, BLB, BPH, and low head rise recovery are some of the key factors. In this context, what climate smart rice hybrids could deliver? So this is a concept again, uh, in order to create this type of hybrids that would have high and stable yields, at the same time provide the abiotic stress tolerances, uh, multiple abiotic stress tolerance, including drought, salinity, submergence, and the biotic stress tolerances like BPH, uh, BLB, blast, major uh, biotic stresses. And it should match the grain quality features of the different market segments and market checks. And I'm able to direct seeded as well as transplanted conditions. Why I refer here on the direct seeded conditions is in the future, we'll see that the direct seeding would become a kind of a trend because of the lack of availability of uh, the irrigation water, especially uh, creating terminal droughts in even in irrigated areas. And uh, th this, uh, this type of direct seeded uh, conditions would increase in the coming days. And what, uh, what are those things uh, will be covered even in this talk. And high resource use efficiency is another important trait. If you look at the, uh, the phosphorus and uh, these, uh, uh, especially phosphorus is basically from the rock phosphates, these are going to deplete as we see, uh, as we go along uh, uh, coming towards 2050, there much of these are depleting resources. And, uh, and uh, many of them are petroleum based uh, resources where nitrogen fertilizers and all these are going to deplete uh, as we are talking. And we need resource use efficiency on the prime topic uh, that uh, has to be in these hybrids as well. And hybridized reproducibility of more than three to uh, more than three tons per hectare is very, very vital for us. And meeting the market requirements of the target region is the core essence of this strategy. Now, in doing so, we need to understand what is the breeding, uh, how we breed the parental lines for these future climatic conditions. And uh, among the major conditions that I look uh, from, a, from a research perspective, the drought and the heat tolerance would be very, very vital. And this would uh, directly affect uh, many of these uh, floral traits. Now, if you look at the floral traits that uh, the CMS lines should have possess is the long stigmatic surfaces and uh, high seed setting rates, uh, out promoting more outcrossing traits. And likewise, the restorers should have heavy pollen load and dehiscence duration should uh, be able to cover the, uh, the female parent. And the climate resilient parents with ideal seed production traits, especially higher combining ability, disease resistance, grain quality matching requirement uh, of the market requirements. Uh, all these are very, uh, would lead to eventual adoption or wide adoption of the hybrid. I would like to uh, share one very important uh, slide here. This is, uh, which I've been, uh, I've shown in many uh, of my presentations in the past. Uh, this is a very classic slide where uh, this, this experiment was conducted in uh, Bahol in, in the Philippines. Uh, where this former Apollinar Asa in Kandehai region seven uh, planted this, uh, we call this uh, line GSRIR 1-8 uh, S6 S3 Y2. Uh, it's also called NSIC RC 480 now. And this guy planted this uh, before, uh, before its release even in this uh, region where the seawater inundates immediately once you uh, when the nursery is uh, transplanted uh, uh, and uh, in four days after transplanting, he sees the seawater comes in because this is a, in, near to the coastline. And after some days, he sees the freshwater inundation of uh, the heavy flooding causes uh, four days of 
this complete submergence of one meter head uh, over the plant height. And then the plant recovers in the same place and you'll see the plant recovery in the same place. And in the same place, then drought strikes uh, quickly in this place and uh, uh, where you'll see where you'll see the, uh, the drought uh, cracks uh, in the field. And at flowering, you'll see the, uh, the, the crop, it looks very good. And the farmer is able to harvest in these circumstances where three major complex traits, uh, salinity followed by flooding and uh, drought, uh, the farmer could harvest 1.2 tons when he never harvested anything. In fact, uh, the farmer was smiling when the seawater came in. He was so sure that nothing would survive. And this is uh, uh, what happened was, generally the farmer would not get any yield. Many of our GSR also were without any harvest in that particular, when we tried five of the GSR varieties were planted in that situation. The most interesting thing is what happens in the normal, when the normal things prevailed, the good season came, uh, then the, the variety shot back to 7.23 tons. And this uh, uh, shift, is the very important reason why the uh, Department of Agriculture in the Philippines took this uh, very seriously and increased the uh, adoption area of this particular act. Today, it has been released as NCRC 480. It was released in two conditions simultaneously in salinity and rainfall drought. And therefore, uh, it was uh, named as GSR 8. And it now occupies 0.7 million hectares in the Philippines and becomes the first uh, truly climate smart rice Across, uh, uh, across the crops. And uh, this particular variety uh, does very well in transplanted condition. It does very well in the uh, direct seeded conditions. It has a uh, very good cooking quality and it looks like this uh, in a normal crop uh, at Piri. And uh, it has the good uh, cooking quality traits and uh, very good in the saline and rain fed environments. And it's spreading into the irrigated areas as well. We did a, a survey uh, based on our socioeconomic uh, scientist from UPLB professor uh, uh, Yorobe, uh, who is a lead uh, economist there. And based on his estimations, uh, he found that nearly a million hectare has been covered in the, uh, in the, in the Philippines alone. And uh, this particular variety uh, touched about 0.7 million hectares. And it's also, uh, uh, very good for uh, including iron toxicity areas. So uh, the reason why I try to show this is basically to give you the excitement how, uh, how this uh, the technology behind it uh, is also illustrated here. What went behind in breeding that particular variety, one has to understand. And this uh, is a very important breeding strategy. We call it as GSR breeding strategy. And it was uh, very, very developed at Erie and it was evolved uh, with the, uh, 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 with the uh, time tested over many, many generations over the last 10 years. And what happened is, what happens here is we use the BC1 F2 generation. You make a cross with one recipient, uh, highly adapted genotype and uh, 10 to 15 restore, uh, do donor parents are crossed and uh, you create BC1 F1 and a BC1 F2 populations, bulk populations. These bulk populations are simultaneously screened for multiple abiotic and biotic stresses. And this uh, BC1 F2 is again uh, progeny tested uh, in BC1 F3, and then again, a third round of testing to confirmation in BC1 F4. When you do three rounds, you are comparing it with the best uh, checks, uh, the, the trade checks, and the best uh, uh, yielding checks, and, under, and this is all carried out also on the normal irrigated conditions as well. So uh, we, we use these materials around, around 1,500 introgression lines, uh, selective introgression lines are created, which can be utilized for mapping, trait mapping for any of the traits that you had screened, and uh, it, it, it easily maps them, uh, and then you can use the, the best yielding ones, about 120, to create the, uh, the preliminary yield trials, uh, uh, replicated trials basically. And then uh, advanced yield trial also replicated in dry and wet season, uh, two seasons to reduce the number to 60 from 120. And then uh, this is sent to the multi-environment trials in different countries and the partners in 16 countries uh, tested them and then they nominate into their national trials. 
and eventually these varieties are released to the farmers. Now, if any of these uh, introduction lines coming from two different uh, uh, donor parents, but a common recipient parent can be used to make a cross, uh, that is called the design QTL pyramiding uh, approach, where you know a particular set of traits uh, coming in one introduction line, but coming from a different donor uh, line, uh, but the case, but both share the same recipient parent. And these two are selectively crossed based on the molecular data. And in F2, again, uh, this is screened for uh, two rounds uh, because in two rounds, you can fix the, uh, the homozygosity and, in, uh, and it can go into the uh, trials. Uh, this is the advantage of this approach. And by this approach, uh, they, uh, uh, both from the Chinese Academy of Agriculture Sciences that shared the GSR varieties in their breeding systems, as well as the ERIS uh, main uh, breeding program, GSR breeding, we could develop uh, about uh, 28 uh, of the uh, varieties were released uh, from ERIS uh, program and in total 56 were released. And uh, the last releases in India were AIR 56 done, uh, which is uh, very important uh, in the context because it is being released in Punjab, Haryana region. And uh, Huang Wang Zan PR 126 uh, is, the, uh, is the recipient parent of this particular line. So PR 126 is already covering 30% of the area in Punjab. And uh, because of its duration is 15 days earlier than PUSA 44, uh, that makes uh, uh, the less irrigation water is required, lesser chemicals, lesser pesticides, and it makes it uh, very much fitting in the uh, rice potato uh, cropping system. And uh, that way, uh, the, the, this particular line can easily replace it because it has drought tolerance and salinity tolerance in addition uh, to the E levels are much impressive than the first generation of GSR varieties. So this uh, gives us a lot of hope and there are more than hundreds of these type of materials in India nominated in the ACRIP trials. Now, if you look at the 28 of them is directly developed and agree and tested, adapted, released and in target countries. The record time was seven to nine years of time and 2.7 million hectares currently cover, uh, deployed, 110 climate smart varieties from ERI are in the pipeline for release over the six countries. And we'll have a look at the closer uh, look at these uh, materials, how they perform under a uh, normal condition, and in, in low input condition under rain fed conditions and in uh, what was the relative advantage of uh, across uh, different conditions. We see that uh, the many of the traits is more than 10% uh, up to 30%, you can see the advantage. And these are the checks below and uh, uh, with which it is compared with the target traits uh, that are used, uh, including on a hybrid SL8. So uh, what we, uh, we realized that that to adopt this into the hybrid breeding program, we can create a similar set of uh, uh, recipient parent from a particular heterotic pool and creating the donor pool of 20 restorers, we can create a similar set of uh, approach where you screen multiple stresses in three rounds and then uh, create a set of uh, elite, uh, uh, good combining ability uh, backgrounds in the adaptable recipient parent and this, uh, restorers uh, coming from the same atrotic pool, we can create hundreds of these restorers uh, with uh, uh, climatic uh, suitable for climatic conditions and especially multiple abiotic and biotic stress tolerances. So this is uh, that approach. This can be extended to even to the maintainer breeding programs. So by this way, uh, we, we also use the, uh, what we call uh, some of the trials that we created under irrigated, uh, low input and cold and uh, salinity, you can see the advantage of the uh, materials. And in our stress in drought is so severe that it kills uh, the, uh, the trial even. Uh, we give about, uh, uh, after 30 days of irrigation, after transplanting, we retract the uh, irrigation in the drought plots, uh, creating near more than, uh, after 51 days, there is no irrigation water in that field. And that even kills much of the material. So that is how we screen drought. And 
when you want to combine, I told you that uh, when you have the common recipient parent, like this particular cross had the common recipient parent, Huang Wang Zhan, and this was coming from one parent, and this is coming from another parent, uh, but the same recipient parent. Uh, we can combine the restorer genes. Uh, both are having restorer genes, and then we screen them in uh, different uh, screens, and these, these selected ones are again redistributed to multiple screens, and uh, after that, we can even uh, do a resequencing or GPS uh, 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 genotyping of this material. And based on this, we can create the, uh, the best materials that can be released as inbreds as well as uh, it can be used in the hybrid breeding program. Now, uh, some of these DQ lines, if you look at uh, the design cutial parameting lines, were much uh, stronger and much higher yielding than the the parental lines that we developed through the, the regular approach of interpretation breeding. So design cutial parameting uh, gave better yields under irrigated. It touches something like 10.4 tons. And to just look at this type of materials is really uh, a wonderful sight to see these materials in the field. And we used the, the GBS uh, called tunable GBS from data to bio. And this publication was done in Frontiers and you can follow this. Uh, just to give you an illustration after the uh, BC1, F5, you can see the most of these loci are either homozygous or uh, uh, the, uh, the major homozygous or minor homozygous. You don't see heterozygous loci at all. So the fixation of the, uh, the genotypes is within uh, very rapidly done in three rounds of screening. And that makes it uh, uh, to achieve the genetic gains much faster than expected uh, by normal approach. So these uh, severe stresses causes the, uh, the rapid fixation. And this process, when we try to analyze the non-synonymous synapse in these materials and these circus diagrams can easily show you that the most of the color-coded uh, uh, green ones are the biotic stresses and the red ones are the, uh, the abiotic stress tolerances and the blue ones are the other uh, stress-related families. You can see when we screen this material for these major genes, known genes, you can see many of these populations, uh, the interrogation lines had these genes selected uh, by this approach. So now we can easily know how to permit these interrogation lines by design. And this is how this whole technology works. Not only that, we can also map different target rates uh, for different target rates for drought, salinity, and we can easily uh, get these peaks uh, and with high load values and uh, uh, these have been mapped very well in many of the uh, populations that we studied. Now to cut this story short, uh, many of these multi-stress now were mostly in the restorer backgrounds. And that made it uh, easy for us when I took charge in 2016 made uh, to on the hybridize, immediately we initiated the crosses between the, the stress tolerant with the CMS lines and the TGMS lines that we developed and uh, made these crosses. And we saw very easily that much of the heterosis uh, was scaled up uh, beyond 20%. And in, in two-line hybrids, it even touched 40%. And uh, this is a very important uh, beginning for developing the climate smart hybrids. And today we have the first generation of hybrids ready and it is uh, going to be tested in different parts of the world. And the second generation would emerge when we convert the CMS line also into climatic uh, climate uh, smartness traits into them. And then when both sides, the both the parents have these traits, that will be uh, the ultimate uh, objective of our breeding program to develop the climate smart. So basically to summarize it, the genomics assisted hybridized parental line breeding, what we did was basically uh, the simultaneous uh, multiple abiotic and biotic stress screening selection scheme is a very interesting uh, approach by where we can uh, employ early generation backcross breeding approach uh, to uh, screen for restorers and maintainer backgrounds uh, uh, by this innovative GSR breeding strategy, where we can uh, uh, not only utilize for QTL discovery, also for the hybridized development. Coming to the several uh, promising parental line uh, developed with multiple abiotic stresses and now currently used in the climate smart hybrid combinations. And the genomic assisted breeding also helped us in understanding which crosses to be used for the uh, design QTL pyramiding approach and uh, pyramided 
and uh, stacked more genes uh, for abiotic stresses uh, over each other. And then we, all can, we can also pyramid non-allelic uh, QTLs or segments that can combine many of these uh, traits from different donors uh, into common recipient parent uh, to develop the climate resilient hybrids in the, as per design and needs. So at ERI, what we are doing currently is uh, we are trying to create hepatic pools and uh, that has been now created. And we use the 3K genomes uh, that was used uh, uh, in our breeding program where more than 500 of these materials were used for directly in the uh, multi-stress uh, breeding programs. And now uh, we, we have classified this, our source nursery into different heterotic pools, as you see on this side. And now uh, when you cross the widely, wider uh, genetic pools, uh, very likelihood that you will get good combinations. And then we are employing the artificial intelligent technologies uh, and also uh, genomic prediction models and machine learning tools uh, to predict the best combinations uh, and to reduce the uh, cost in identifying the best combinations. And uh, uh, this way uh, we have, uh, uh, we can uh, be sure of our success rate increases. Recently, we published a paper on the heterosis breeding via genomic selection in rice. And this uh, uh, paper uh, was published with the UC Riverside, uh, Shijong Shu, uh, who is uh, uh, the, uh, the scientist at uh, uh, UC Riverside. And the, the first author is a postdoc, and she did this work. And this is a wonderful work where they use the uh, existing rice population of 1,495 and using GBLUFs uh, uh, to perform the hybrid performance predictions, uh, they could also not only uh, replicate tenfold validations across prediction abilities uh, on 10 agronomic traits that range between 0.35 to 0.92. But if you look at the uh, yield uh, prediction was 0.54, but major genes like uh, grain length was 0.92. And now you can predict uh, using these uh, founder lines you can predict uh, even cross combinations without need of uh, your parental lines to be in that uh, set of founder lines. This uh, would be extended to the current uh, ERI uh, breeding programs where we'll be extrapolating that information to predict the best combinations here. And uh, uh, the other scheme that I would like to highlight here is the, uh, the 1000 F1 trial. This 1000 F1 trial is a very, very uh, ambitious project. Uh, which is already uh, uh, started in 2019. And uh, uh, they, there are 10 locations, basically. Uh, you don't, uh, we don't cover 1,000 F1 in uh, all of these sites, but we divide these 1,000 F1s into 50% coming from the MRYT trials that the HRDC members contribute to the, uh, the HRDC membership. They have their slots of known hybrids uh, with their best performing hybrids from the industry. And 50% of the hybrids are from the Iris hybrid program. And 20% uh, of this, uh, 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 so let me put it like this, 40 coming from private sector, 40 coming from Iris, and 20% coming from the best market checks, uh, including the best market checks in their locations. And every 40 of these individual uh, uh, hybrids are basically customized for each location so that the People who are evaluating, they are looking at the ERI hybrids that are customized for that region and comparing it with the best uh, hybrids from the industry and best uh, Czech hybrids in, the, uh, uh, in that region. So basically, there's, this is called uh, a kind of spatial testing and sparse testing. And uh, you can see the grain uh, yield performance of all hybrids in each location is predicted. The best hybrid combinations in different and across regions can be identified. And each cooperator would know which hybrid combinations are doing well. But at the backside of this, we know at ERI, we'll know that which of our combinations and which parental lines did good in, in a given target region. And immediately these uh, breeding uh, materials would be quickly employed to uh, create the next generation of parental line breeding. We will rapidly go by the RGA, uh, rapid generation advancement and forward breeding approaches to breed superior parents. And these superior parents would help in developing these superior hybrids. And in this way, uh, a cycle of another set of 1000 F1s would be created. And uh, this would uh, help in uh, achieving the genetic gains uh, in the hybrid breeding program. And this is very important uh, 
from a hybrid uh, research standpoint of view, when your hybrids get into multiple environments, and this will be super laid uh, over by grain quality and disease and other uh, layers will be uh, uh, layered over it. And this would uh, increase our uh, uh, collective genotyping and phenotyping approaches that will be uh, helping us to map only all the tra major traits uh, that are concerning this the hybrid uh, hybridized research. And uh, this will be a fantastic uh, 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 design, but uh, to implement and get it done in the coming years is going to be one of the biggest challenge, especially in the COVID times when seed movements are highly restricted and uh, taking a little more time. And this is one such a plot at Erie of the 1000 F1 trial. Uh, you can see uh, this was in 2019 and uh, uh, we saw this uh, results were very good. And we also not only working on the uh, very important uh, uh, insect BPH, which is much influenced by the climatic conditions, and they come in uh, in uh, big waves in especially in Indonesia, where BPH is one of the major uh, problems there. And uh, this BPH 38 is a novel gene identified uh, in the Hong Kong Zan background with the uh, gene coming from the Khazar uh, donor and. Uh, one of the reasons for this, uh, we narrowed down to this uh, particular 260 uh, loci, uh, which uh, could be one of the F1, F box proteins and uh, possessing the, the uh, leucine rich repeat domain uh, and could be involved in the salicyclic uh, uh, signaling pathways that gives uh, BPH resistance. And uh, uh, we are trying to incorporate this into our breeding materials, especially restorers and maintainers to confer this tolerance into the hybrids as well. Also, at the same time, we are also working on the, uh, the nutrient use efficient traits. We mapped uh, recently a paper uh, which was published in PLOS One, you can refer to that. But to cut this story short, we, we could map 19 tutorials that were screened uh, at uh, different stages. At the same time, at different levels of uh, uh, the nutrient uh, used like zero NPK, 80% NPK, suboptimal and 100% uh, NPK. By doing so, we could easily detect uh, two major uh, hotspots, especially on chromosome two, uh, especially the, uh, the OS NPF 7.1 and the OS GF4. Uh, and this is a growth uh, regulatory factor and the NPF is a nitrate dye tripeptide transporter uh, this technically uh, uh, helps in the use efficiency uh, pathways. And what we achieved in the hybridized program is we could successfully release and uh, 17 hybrids out of which six were first time commercialized to uh, uh, the private sector on limited exclusivity uh, for a six year period to especially uh, three of these hybrids to Tau Corporation and another two hybrids to SL Agritech. And we have currently members up to 88 in the, in the HRDC membership. We publish our annual report uh, too and it's shared with the HRDC members annually. And many of the platinum green and green members are free to join. There is no uh, cost for them. The private membership starts at $20,000 per annum and uh, the platinum starts at 45K. And these are the uh, models by which one can really uh, utilize the, the germplasm that is uh, freely sh uh, shared with the public sector, but it is uh, uh, given to the public and private, the uh, private partners for, uh, uh, for, uh, for their members, uh, for their membership. And we bring this value to them. These are the uh, six hybrids that I mentioned. Uh, one of them is a two-line hybrid, uh, MST-061. I take you to another topic where, uh, which is much related to the uh, direct seeded hybrids. Uh, we are working very seriously on this topic on development of uh, direct seeded hybrids. Our first uh, 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 low-hanging fruit was uh, MST-089, which turned out to be very, very good for uh, direct seeded conditions. And this was uh, verified by the direct seeded rice consortium which is a consortium for uh, uh, dark seeded and led by Dr. Virender at Erie. 
And this is uh, uh, one of the uh, early uh, situation where we could identify this. Now we are having a very full-fledged breeding program on the parental line breeding, or, uh, uh, and also developing many DSR hybrids. And uh, using the, the, the integration lines that we developed in the past, many of them were also direct seeded uh, high inbreds that we developed. And these are now in the restorer backgrounds and directly utilized. But to understand the key traits that are required to develop the uh, DSR hybrids, the foremost is the anaerobic germination tolerance, emergence from deeper soil depths, shorter duration, high yield uh, potential, weed suppressiveness and uh, herbicide tolerance should be incorporated. Lodging resistance is a key trait and tolerance to abiotic stresses, especially drought and uh, nutrient use efficiency are very important. Provided we have this, uh, this, uh, this type of direct seeded hybrids uh, can be also, uh, uh, we can employ alternate wetting and drying uh, strategy, thereby reducing the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in these plots. And direct seeded rice is really the future in the coming days. And we also, also in progressing uh, B, uh, BPH, uh, Tungro and BLAST and BLB resistance genes uh, into the, uh, the maintainer and restorer lines, uh, elite restorers and maintainers, which will be shared with the HRDC members soon. And also IRI has been in the forefront to share such knowledge of uh, marker arrested breeding for hybridized technology. And we have listed uh, here uh, several of these uh, based uh, gene-based uh, gene markers, uh, which are uh, available for people to use for the marker estate breeding and utilization in their pipelines. And also, uh, IRI introduced uh, the uh, forward breeding approach for hybridized uh, with 10 uh, markers uh, with the Intertech uh, uh, panel, uh, which is also available uh, for uh, people to use uh, for their breeding efforts. And by this way, uh, we can do a forward breeding approach where many of the B by B and R by R crosses can be filtered quickly in the early generations for using these markers and uh, progress in RGA single seed descent approach uh, rapidly to F3 to F6 in 1.2 years. And therefore we can create uh, materials in two years uh, that can be shared with the members. I try to cover another important area which everybody would be excited is the two line hybridized technology. How this uh, helps in the climate smart hybrid, uh, climate smart hybrids to uh, propagate in much uh, cheaper and much uh, sophisticated manner. But now to understand this, uh, one has to uh, understand uh, temperature sensitive genic, uh, genetic male sterility system uh, uh, for two line hybrid development. Now, this is a major gene and, uh, uh, and it's a recessive uh, gene uh, located in the nucleus and uh, it requires uh, low temperature uh, to become fertile or uh, in, in, and this can be achieved in the low temperature conditions where the plants are raised and multiplied. And these seeds are brought to high temperature regions and uh, where it can be restored by any non-TGMS, which we call as pollen parent, uh, can restore the fertility of this. So there is no such thing like a restorer here or a maintainer here. Any parent can restore the fertility in the TGMS lines. And this is how uh, the benefit is you cut away the maintenance part and the cost of seed production can be uh, reduced by at least 40 to 50%. And if you see the history of uh, uh, the two-line technology was way back when I did my PhD, I, we developed eight TGMS lines and, uh, and many of the, uh, the early findings are there in this uh, manual that we published long back. But this technology never lifted up. And we understood that one of the major reasons uh, despite the advantages that it has, like I told you, maintainer can be avoided, choice of parents are broadened, and the genes are very major genes, so it can be easily transferred. There is no negative effect of the cytoplasm that the hybrids do have if you have a, the WS uh, wild abortive cytoplasm. It has also higher seed production ability than the three-line system. So we can easily cross three tons through this approach. And two-line hybrid rights uh, generally yields higher than the three-line hybrids by 10%. So that makes it attractive. Now, the key element here is to produce a hybrid uh, parental line that will become, sterile, uh, become completely male sterile at 24 degrees centigrade or even lower than that. 
So this is our objective here to breed this. And this was not available in the past. And recently, uh, over the last few years, we could develop this particular uh, line. And uh, uh, we have created a new study group called the two-line study group, where uh, a set of uh, like-minded companies have come forward to fund this research. And we have been successful in going forward in testing and uh, validating for commercial uh, commercialization of the two-line in India and other parts of the world. And if you look at the one of the two-line hybrids here, 254, which was tested in Hyderabad in 2018, and we can see the advantage over US 337 and MTU 1010 by 21%. And this is another old uh, TGMS line uh, using the older version, uh, which is also doing good and did well in Hyderabad. And uh, we had uh, also done in Varanasi last year in 2019, uh, where it uh, outdated RI644 gold by almost 7%. Uh, uh, and the, this 554 did with 6.5%, and over Sava 127, 13, and 12%. So this is uh, very important to understand that the two-line hybrids are uh, important features that uh, can uh, uh, lead the way uh, based on especially reducing the cost of seeds and the atrocities, increased atrocities. 554 uh, has a climate smart uh, traits like drought, and uh, low input, uh, or we can call it as nutrient use efficiency is higher in these hybrids. And these are being uh, validated and tested uh, in the different sites in India now. And I'm very optimistic about this hybrid's performance, uh, which is already uh, nominated in the Philippines National Field, Cooper Field Cooperative Trials. Now to summarize the whole uh, talk, uh, what would be the future hybridized research direction? Now climate smart hybrids are being evaluated now in vulnerable target regions in different parts of the world. Newer climate smart products involving heat, cold, elevated levels of CO2 are the key uh, areas, including even ozone. These could be one of the few futuristic climatic conditions would warrant us to work on these ones, including nutrient and water use efficiency. So the hybridized program currently is uh, uh, dealing with these areas for our research. And we are trying to uh, look at the interactions that could be also interplaced would be there between these target traits and how these uh, could be pulled properly by uh, good uh, breeding design. And uh, that's what we are looking at. And designing new CMS lines and TGMS lines that matches the market requirements of three line and two line hybrids are very important and innovative uh, approaches like genomic prediction of heterosis and artificial intelligence could lower or narrow down our combinations that we would like to test and cost reduction and precision heterosis breeding is going to be the future. Two-line hybridized technology would become uh, a commercial reality in tropical Asia, provided we have the usable low temperature uh, or the low critical stability point below 24 degrees centigrade. If you have something like 23 or 22, I'm sure we will be able to get it right. And the genomic edit editing tools, I don't know uh, many countries still are keeping this under the GM category, but sooner or later, this would be understood as one of the future techniques and it would become as a routine. And it would be easy for us to target, edit target traits and quickly get to the uh, help for the farmers in addressing some of the key target traits correction, and uh, we will be in a better situation in this regard. And hybridized technology is cannot be uh, lifted without the human resources being trained. And this is one of the very key aspects where we are very much uh, in the HRDC as well as other platforms, we are very much concerned for training more human resources that can uh, understand the how to breed climate smartness in their parental lines and how to develop hybrids and uh, how to uh, do seed production uh, in, in their own respective regions uh, uh, is very important. And it is uh, also has uh, the, the, we would like to uh, look at the future to create a center of excellence for hybridized research and extension that would cater these type of things in the future. And uh, this is something uh, which is very much practical keeping the consideration of food security, I think uh, wise investment should be in this direction 
to create this type of centers of excellence uh, for such an important technology. And of course, a social impact, a socioeconomic impacts should be uh, should be tested, uh, should be tried for the climate smart hybrids in the coming years, especially in Asia and Africa. I think uh, I will uh, try to conclude here and uh, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, all my team members, uh, especially in the GSR project uh, that was funded by Bill and Melinda Gates team and the entire GSR team that uh, participated from CAS, CAS, Chinese Academy of Culture Sciences, ERI and Africa RISE and NARAS partners from 16 countries are all duly acknowledged. Uh, we have uh, uh, our uh, rice, leader, rice breeding platform leader, Hans, uh, who, is, uh, who has helped us to uh, project this uh, whole uh, uh, new dimension of the uh, hybrid uh, breeding platform, hybrid uh, breeding uh, cluster in a different way. And uh, also I, I like to acknowledge Remy's contribution to take it to the uh, private sector in a, in a very energetic manner and his team uh, uh, also comprised of Ajay, Lingal, Roberto, uh, and so my uh, team uh, from Anna, Pauline, uh, Tini, uh, and also the HRDC Advisory Committee, hybridized breeding team involving Lito, Kaloy, Eric, Anna, Christian, Donna, Roy, Bea, Jonas, Lolit, Makto, and Sinan. I really appreciate their help and uh, in making this possible. And uh, our breeding clusters uh, uh, approach is written in this uh, caption here, developing superior high, high yielding high, heterotic high rice hybrids that meet market requirements, adopting genomic tools, and to strengthen and invigorate the hybrid seed industry through the hybrid rice development consortium by providing elite hybrids and parental lines and technical know-how. With this, you can visit our websites, uh, HRDC website for more information and uh, it is uh, 60th year. I think uh, we, uh, we are uh, uh, marching forward to go beyond rise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, you have, uh, we have uh, some question in uh, Q&A box. That is the after the skin share, the polling and then Q&A. Uh, I'm not able to open that. Just a minute. In bottom, in bottom. I have to stop. Uh, I think stop sharing. Yes. It, right? uh, okay. So, uh, yes. Okay. Now it comes actually. Okay. Good. Uh, yes. Okay. So, so, so we put uh, some up, selected them, but uh, it's that comes randomly. So you can uh, answer a few of them from that Q and box section. Uh, where, where should I find that? It to, is there, okay, uh, just, okay. yes, yes, okay. 34, it's so started. 34 questions, my goodness. <laughs> okay. So you are interesting, I, I, you are interesting. <laughs> yeah, it means a lot of interest it has generated. Anyway, yes. uh, the hybridized varieties released in India are, are yet to release. What are the varieties and what rates and yield rate, tons per hectare? Is it successful in India or not? I think the 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 uh, you should understand that ICR Indian Council of Agricultural Research uh, with its partners, especially IIRR and uh, IARI and NR uh, National Rice Research Institute, are members of the HRDC, and we are uh, uh, sharing with the about twenty six private uh, uh, private members from India alone, who who have utilized our materials and. Uh, not only our parental lines and uh, materials, also we are sharing with them many of the varieties uh, from the HRDC, which they have been testing. And uh, I'm sure many of them would be in their uh, uh, coming to their pipeline for uh, release and uh, utilization. As of now, uh, we have not uh, any major release in India in terms of direct release, but in the Philippines, we have uh, made 17 releases. I think I will go to the next question. Yes. Uh, can you explain how artificial intelligence predict heterotic combinations? Yeah, this is uh, these type of tools are basically coming from some uh, outsourcing uh, done by Computomics and other agencies are there, which can use artificial intelligence to predict the hybrid combinations. Uh, basically, this uh, uses the the uh, the genomic uh, uh, knowledge, uh, the genomic sequences are known. Uh, the uh, the environments in which they are to be grown, this is known, and uh, their phenotypic 
uh, traits are known uh, for a given set and then uh, in the places where they are uh, grown once that uh, of the founder lines are known then it becomes it's just like putting more and more data into it it starts um, uh, it's a machine learning process including the g blobs and the uh, blobs would uh, kind of um, uh, machine learning process and the artificial intelligence basically breeds on this and accumulates more and more information as it becomes more intelligent uh, by itself and it will say okay use these combinations these are the best ones for you i think uh, uh, this is the way it does the artificial intelligence but it it needs a lot of information in the first place coming from different trials and this gets fed, fed into it uh, repeatedly by very good algorithms uh, of machine learning and that's how the machine inter artificial intelligence grows uh, it becomes uh, uh, it grows with time actually and then we have a uh, grain number per panicles in hybridized varieties is it for 300 400 it is not important uh, what is the grain number it is ultimately the grain yield sometimes there are compensation mechanisms uh, in some uh, panicles would have more uh, uh, something like 350 to 400 uh, or some would have 250 to 300 uh, 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 grains per panicle. But then the number of tailors, number of uh, uh, productive uh, uh, panicles and the sterility at the bottom of these pipelets, all this matters in the total grain yield. And I would suggest watch out for the final grain yield per plot that would determine ultimately uh, the yield. And of course, uh, these are uh, yield component traits. It matters a lot, uh, but higher uh, uh, with uh, more productive tillers is very essential. The next question is from David Chen. Uh, sorry to clarify, what are the desirable traits and characteristics of variety that makes it better for direct seeding? In case I was unclear in the previous question, I think uh, the direct seeded conditions, basically uh, the traits that are important, you see when people will uh, throw direct seeded in dry bed condition or wet bed conditions, basically uh, uh, in wet bed conditions, you need anaerobic germination tolerance because the moment you throw the seeds, you will inundate with uh, water and uh, the water would not allow the germination of these seeds, but it will control the weeds. So for control of the weeds, you need to uh, keep the uh, water film over the uh, surface of the, so that you can control the weeds. And therefore, a, a anaerobic germination tolerance is very vital. Then the, the under deeper depths of soil, especially in dry bed, sowing, sometimes the seed falls uh, to a lower uh, depths and uh, that ability to uh, grow from that, uh, uh, from two centimeter below depth, it should be possible for this, uh, uh, this should be a trait as such. And likewise, uh, the herbicide tolerant resistance and uh, <coughs> I think uh, many of these traits are very important, early vigor. Uh, and uh, uh, if you had seen that uh, figure on that, I had illustrated most of these traits there. I think uh, you can look at that. And uh, herbicide resistance uh, tolerance like uh, what we are working with the BSF, uh, Clearfield and uh, Provisia technologies are there. Also herbicide genes uh, can be incorporated that will take care of the herbic uh, herbicides that we can apply on these plants to make it really effective. Another one uh, from anonymous attendee, burden or on farmer for seed every season as hybrids segregate. Uh, uh, I think one has to understand uh, Hybrids have to be used only one season for its exploitation, F1. Once a farmer buys the seed, uh, they have to use one season and not to grow the sec F2. And the farmer uh, uh, benefits from the higher yields of more than 1.5 to two tons in, uh, in, con in conditions, especially in uh, fav favorable rain fed conditions. The advantage is sometimes even more than 50%. Uh, and in irrigated conditions, it touches 30%. So the extra yield that he gets, it is possible for a farmer to invest on it. And we have seen this in uh, time again in the rain-fed uh, areas in India, the hybrids are uh, prolif uh, uh, prolifying in these uh, regions where the farmers are really poor, but now they are, their income has increased because of the hybrid technology uh, where the farmers are gaining on the uh, adv advantage 
of the hybrids over the inbreds. And uh, in fact, the, it is not a burden when you see the profitability in the front. Uh, so uh, that is something people uh, uh, always uh, feel that that is the way. But I would uh, uh, suggest people to look at the advantage. And the seed rate is some only 16 kg per hectare. And uh, we are trying to go below that even. So uh, that is not uh, when you compare with inbreds, which is 35 kg per hectare, sometimes 150 kg in direct seeded conditions, people are growing. And when you compare uh, this with 16 kg, it should not be difficult. Uh, next question I see uh, is from uh, Afsana Ansari. What is the highest e uh, seed yield of hybrid rice in the world, both in CMS yield and F1? I think, uh, uh, the, the best yields can touch uh, up to six tons in uh, uh, the best yields, I'm telling you. It can touch even six tons in, uh, in cases where China has reported. Uh, but uh, to be realistic, uh, on an average, uh, you can touch uh, 3.5 tons uh, in, uh, in China. They can do it. Uh, in India, the average uh, seed deals are touching 2.5 tons comfortably. And uh, we are viewing whether we can cross the three tons in the tropical regions. So this is very much influenced by the temperature and the climatic conditions where you produce the seed. So one has to understand that CMS yields uh, are largely depend on, uh, dependent on the type of CMS lines that you use. So outcrossing traits uh, facilitate the higher seed yields and the CMS yields also becomes much higher than the uh, A by R seeds uh, to the same level. And uh, even in fact more because of the uh, synchronous flowering, and uh, it is uh, more than 3.5 tons we can expect in case of uh, A by B in, in Indian conditions. And uh, how can we get these hybrid rice varieties in Pakistan? We have a partner in Pakistan, the Rice Research Institute in Kalasha Kaku is uh, getting, the. it is a member of the HRDC, and the private sector who are interested in, from Pakistan, they can become members of the HRDC as well. And they can uh, at $20,000 per year, but they can really make money when the, uh, uh, when the time comes for uh, licensing. You have to pay a very low upfront, uh, low uh, licensing fees, which is just like 2.5% uh, of the uh, of a given hybrid. Uh, and uh, one point, uh, 5% uh, for restorer. Uh, and uh, this is very, very low, low uh, level of uh, licensing fees because ERI wants to use these funds not for uh, uh, increasing our coffers, but we want to increase the investment into hybridized research. And this money goes back to the public's uh, utility where we bring and plow back this money and bring more uh, rich dividends to the hybridized research. And this is how this whole pattern works. And therefore uh, the public sector receives the seeds free. The private sector receives uh, for a uh, token money of uh, uh, licensing this at a later stage. So I would encourage all private sector, whether it's from Pakistan, India, or any other country who are interested uh, for similar questions, uh, they should uh, contact HRDC uh, Secretariat. We have a HRDC website. I would encourage uh, people to become members and take the benefit to their country and to their region. And I told you public sector uh, are free to uh, become members. Next question coming from Anuj Kumar. Sir, what is the future of hybridize in India? And now majority of the area is under pure line varieties. I think Anuj, you are uh, not aware that the, currently the area under hybridize is 3.5 million hectares. Uh, and this area is likely to grow uh, very rapidly in the coming days when the food crisis is going to hit. People will switch the uh, button to hybrid rice because that is the only viable approach. Any planner would look at it. Uh, you don't have any other alternative approach at this moment uh, that can give 25 to 30% uh, increased productivity. And uh, uh, I, I, I really... Uh, 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 people should uh, align themselves with this concept in their mind. What is the next question, uh, Miraj? Uh, what is the difference between hybridized varieties and improved varieties? I, uh, the major difference is the hybrids have early vigor and they uh, are uh, they can be combined with any type of tolerances by complementing the traits in two parents and you bring it into the hybrid. 
The grain quality can be customized based on the grain quality parameters of the two parents. So you can really address the hybrid varieties as we want. So it is what is in the parents is what is the hybrid is all about. So you want to have good quality hybrids, you can have good quality, you can have basmati hybrids for that matter. But uh, the bigger difference in improved varieties is 25 to 30 percent yield advantage is the biggest factor that uh, helps the hybrid varieties uh, adoption. And then uh, uh, Supraja uh, say uh, requesting the best method for development of hybrids. I think uh, I showed you all the methods, but uh, Erie is now uh, uh, engaging on the one line, one rice breeding approach uh, based on the genomic selection. And we are also employing the genomic selection in the heterotic pools and uh, for uh, the parental line uh, breeding. And uh, this is one rice breeding uh, is very, very essential and will be become the future way of uh, breeding both for inbreds and hybrids. And many uh, countries and uh, including the CG centers are already adapting to this one rice breeding. Uh, so this is a new uh, area which will be soon, uh, uh, you will be listening to it to more. Uh, okay, so next question is Acharya uh, wants to know uh, restorer line or maintenance line are from wild variety or cultivated type. The gene uh, that came from the, uh, the, uh, the sterility gene that is located in the mitochondria uh, comes from wild abortive cytoplasm, uh, uh, which is coming from Oriza sativa spontanea, uh, which was the first source of WA cytoplasm, uh, which was discovered in uh, China and it later it was shared to IRI and from IRI to all the uh, Asian countries, these uh, lines were developed and uh, into the CMS backgrounds and they were freely shared with uh, the the region so so the the, the restorer genes are available in uh, indica backgrounds plenty of it but in japonica you don't have restorers and that is the reason why two line approach is very good approach to create inter specific hybrids between indica and japonica now coming to raj kumar uh, how non allelic qtl pyramiding have advantage over allelic qtl pyramiding under what circumstances we can sort non-allelic QTL pyramiding. I think uh, this is uh, the advantages are relative uh, between non-allelic and allelic QTL pyramiding, but the, the, the key factor lies on what type of traits that we are moving and uh, how we are uh, preparing the alignment and uh, the benefits of that. So generally uh, when you are using uh, different donors and uh, common recipient parents, uh, and these uh, uh, non-allelic segments for a given target trait uh, gives contributes to the drought tolerance or salinity tolerance and uh, uh, whether it's allelic or non-allelic, but generally uh, non-allelic segments uh, help in pyramiding or pooling the best part of the QTLs together. And uh, as well as uh, uh, I think uh, you have to uh, look at our paper uh, that uh, was published on the uh, GSR breeding approach uh, in uh, the uh, theoretical applied genetics journal recently uh, in 2020. So uh, 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 I went out. Is that the question remaining? So there is a, there are so many questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I thought that was the end of the page actually. Uh, no. So. There. <laughs> There is so many. If if when you feel it's okay, we we can stop it. So yeah, you you let me uh, you let me know. But I uh, based on the on the top priority on the top, I'm yes. just list, uh, telling them. Okay. Okay. But if it's similar question, I will uh, if yes. I had answered. But they are all different questions. That's very interesting yes. for yes. me too. Yes. Yes. The wild rice Rufi Pogon cross can be a valuable pre breeding material. Of course, uh, any wild resources uh, uh, can be very useful. XA genes like. Uh, XA23 came from Rufi Pogon. Sometimes the yield genes uh, have been uh, cloned and uh, from Rufi Pogon. I think these are uh, approaches where you can uh, you can utilize these type of materials. Uh, then David Chen uh, puts a question uh, uh, rightfully pointed out there are certain materials such as fertilizers, which are uh, originates from non-renewable resources. Assuming climate smart would be the ones that is most efficiently utilizing. Is there a quantitative measure of nitrogen efficiency between common varieties and climate smart varieties? I think uh, this is a very important question. I think we published a recent paper in PLOS One, how this could be uh, evaluated. And uh, 
uh, uh, really uh, the phosphorus is one of the biggest challenges because this is going to be completely, uh, you'll not have a renewable source for this. And uh, as we go along spreading towards 2050, the challenge would become uh, more serious as we go along. Which And these countries are located in uh, Morocco, uh, Russia, and all these countries. Whether they will trade uh, these type of fertilizers even would be a question mark. Uh, how long they will keep mining these rock phosphates? And uh, so these are really big questions. And of course, the use efficiency, uh, we actually use the partial factor productivity and the agronomic use efficiency for mapping the QTLs for that. But uh, there are certain, uh, the best uh, approach would be the physiological uh, use, uh, physiological use efficiency, uh, which is very, very, uh, uh, physiological efficiency is one of the most important uh, 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 approaches to measure the differences between nitrogen use efficiency. And definitely the uh, hybrids uh, would stand out because of their uh, heterotic uh, combinations there. Uh, they will be uh, much uh, in higher use efficiency if we incorporate the genes rightly. Uh, recently released hybrids and varieties in India, I think uh, uh, ACRIP has uh, regular uh, trials and uh, many of the companies put their hybrids there. I think one should refer to that. Uh, uh, Sorry if I just skipped anything by mistake. Huh? Okay, Deepan Roy and uh, Roy. Uh, Global Rice Research Array, HRDC doing the same thing for ERI. Uh, is it a question? Yeah, our uh, Global Rice Research Array and HRDC doing. Yeah, kind of, because what eventually uh, these type of arrays or these type of multi location trials would be similar in some approach, but what we are trying to do in the new uh, one rice reading uh, approach, uh, we'll, we'll be combining many of these things into one single uh, way of testing these materials. And it will be very robust in its testing approach. And I'm, uh, we are expecting very soon this will be laid out and Hans is leading on this uh, approach and uh, we will be seeing this happening soon. Sudhakar, uh, as nice presentation, can these lines be accommodated to air? Of course, these lines, many of these hybrids, as well as the uh, inbreds that we developed can, are well uh, adapted to aerobic conditions. Uh, and uh, we have shared many of these lines with many countries in the past. Uh, how can we introduce two line hybrid in our country? I think uh, uh, at this moment, two line hybrids, uh, uh, we are sharing uh, with the two line study team where we are trying to uh, completely validate the commercialization of tow line hybrids from private point, private sector point of view. And immediately these type of materials would be uh, brought to different countries for testing. And uh, the best way is to uh, look out for this study group uh, that has been formed recently in 2019. And this is a very, very robust uh, uh, set of companies and uh, public sector institutions have joined hands to see uh, how this can be commercialized. I think uh, uh, once that is done, many of these things would uh, eventually reach uh, different countries. Uh, do on rice uh, uh, have anything to do with climate proofing? Uh, on rice, to my understanding, uh, in a, it's a joke rather than a thing that it is uh, bird proof, I believe. <laughs> more than that, the, the, uh, sometimes this ons keeps these uh, birds away. Uh, sometimes that is the only thing, but generally uh, on traits are not preferred in many parts of the world, but there are places where people like on also, because I told you it gives bird, uh, birds not damage it because it gets, uh, it protects from the birds. So anyway, that is, uh, it also gets stuck up in their throat or something like that. So this is uh, on rice, but I doubt whether it has any climate proofing. Uh, when we, uh, uh, administrator, uh, when we evaluate hybrids for eels or other characters, can we uh, use for other commercial hybrid or check or standard varieties? Uh, when we evaluate uh, hybrids for eels? Uh, okay, so we always use the hybrid checks and uh, the best commercial market checks. So whenever the eels are comparable or bringing some new traits into them, uh, or is uh, robust in some manner, 
uh, the, the people can easily evaluate it and then uh, based on the grain quality and the acceptance of the farmers, definitely one should be able to commercialize them. Uh, the next question is the anonymous attendee. What can we uh, uh, what can we use hybrid uh, rice in organic farming because it need more uh, quantity of nutrients or so? How to fulfill requirement of nutrients in organic farming? Uh, so of course, uh, hybrid rice can be used in any type of farming. Uh, farming approaches can vary; doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, such a hybrids, especially use efficient hybrids. Uh, or should be a very perfect fit for this type of thing. But uh, I would not encourage uh, organic farming uh, in, that, in the sense to uh, keep food security uh, when uh, food security is becoming a challenge. Even if you put all the nutrients, uh, they are not going to give you the best returns. And if you are going to use organic farming with organic uh, fertilization and uh, to replace the chemical fertilizers, I think uh, that is going to be a challenge. But uh, hybrids are always good in utilizing any kind of nutrients compared with inbreds. So uh, it should not be a problem in adopting hybridized for organic farming. So you're welcome to use uh, if it is uh, your viewpoint. Uh, when we, okay, we are on so many questions. Okay, so. Uh, Arun asks, uh, sir, whether photosynthetic, photosensitive rice varieties can be converted to photoinsensitive or any possible way to make it flowering? Yeah, of course, uh, this is through mutation breeding. Of course, uh, you can mutation uh, or gene editing can be done, but GM is not in many plots of the world still. So you knock down this gene, you can make it insensitive. Uh, and all those things can be done. I think it's possible. Uh, and through breeding also it is possible to replace the gene. Uh, so uh, we, we, we think uh, we got, uh, we received so many questions. There is a hundred questions. We minimized uh, half of them and it's it's increasing. <laughs> it's increasing uh, like a pop-up and increasing. So uh, I, I think they are very much interested and they uh, understand because there, there are so many comments in the YouTube that your every slide is very nice and very understandable. So uh, that is the reason the the the, uh, the question number of questions. So sir, yeah, I, I'm 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 happy to answer, but I, I think time doesn't permit for everyone yes, to yes. sit tightly. Uh, I think uh, yes. Uh, so we we, we would uh, wanted to uh, move in our next session. That is the interview because so many young uh, young fellow are waiting for that section. They are very appreciated how uh -huh. uh, how your career is built. So I'm uh, giving the uh, uh, space to Shoma. Shoma will uh, conduct that interview. Hello. Um, we are now uh, moving ahead to the interview section of today's webinar. Today is our 10th webinar of the series. We are honored to have with us Dr. Jawhar Ali from the International Rice Research Institute, Philippines. Uh, sir, uh, you're a pioneer in your field of research. Uh, we would love to know how you started your career. Uh, please tell us about your journey so far as a plant scientist. Yeah, my journey actually was really very interesting. Uh, right in the beginning, if I remember, uh, as a child, actually, as a child of school going kid, I uh, had a deep interest in, uh, we were located near to the uh, IARI, Indian Agriculture Research Institute. So very often uh, I would go through those fields. And early on, I, uh, I got this uh, uh, liking for agriculture. And uh, I took a chance, uh, I took, uh, after matriculation, I joined uh, my BS agriculture in Punjab Agriculture University, Ludhiana. Uh, there was a program to join after 10th. I said, why should I waste my 10th and 11th and 12th degree to, uh, and then join uh, and I could save a year from that. Uh, so I joined after matriculation. And I saved one year of my time. Actually, it was a five-year program. Then after joining there, uh, I remember uh, uh, I had been very great, uh, hugely influenced by uh, stalwarts, rice stalwarts like M.S. Swaminathan, uh, Dr. Gurudev Kush, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Siddiq. Uh, they, they were actually uh, my, uh, in many ways, they were like mentors for, for me everything. And uh, I had the opportunity uh, to listen to Dr. Kush 
uh, in the front rows, I was sitting as an undergraduate student of BS Agriculture in the front rows of the auditorium, listening to Dr. Kosh when he was presenting the IR36 uh, uh, rice variety was being uh, sh uh, showcased. So at uh, in Punjab Agriculture University, I was in the front rows listening to him very, that really moved my, uh, uh, me towards more towards uh, crop breeding and genetics. And uh, I, I took uh, MS in genetics uh, later at Indian Agriculture Research Institute, where I uh, uh, had the opportunity at that time, I remember 1988, IRA introduced the entrance exam at that time. Many people uh, maybe uh, may not be aware when IRA introduced the entrance exam. And to my uh, good luck or bad luck, I don't know. I, I was introduced, uh, I was interviewed by more than uh, 400 people were interviewed for MS position for seven slots of MS degree in genetics. And I was lucky to get through, uh, I was a fourth ranker at that time. But anyway, so uh, it was really exciting for me uh, to get into IRI for, uh, and it's a very premier institute in this region, in, especially in India. And, uh, and then I had the opportunity to work on uh, chemical gametocytes that are chemical gametocytes or we call it as chemical hybridizing agents for my masters. Uh, mm -hmm. That was time when no CMS lines were available in India. Uh, unlike, uh, because this was a technology coming from China, then it came to ERI, uh, some of these materials and the ERI was breeding these materials and these ERI bred CMS lines didn't enter India at that time in 88. And mm -hmm. we worked on uh, chemical hybridizing agents as an alternative approach to selectively sterilize the males and leaving the females uh, fertile. And mm -hmm. that way, can we produce chemically hybridized hybrids? So that was my MS thesis all about. And we discovered a group of chemicals called oxanilates. Uh, mm -hmm. And that sparked a uh, lot of interest at that time. And uh, then I did my PhD also on two line uh, hybrids. Uh, at that time, uh, Mariama in 1990 was one of the lead uh, scientists who discovered the TGMS in uh, Japonica background in Norin PL12. And at the same time uh, in India, uh, 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 the, the scientists were looking how to get it done for Indian context. And uh, at that time, this uh, a team went to uh, Japan to Mariama's lab and uh, the materials were not to be shared with India at that time. Uh, okay. because of the huge costs. Uh, mm -hmm. They were demanding a very huge money for that. So then the, 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 the thesis problem came in IRI and they said, can we do repeat uh, mutation breeding for that? I said, uh, how can you search a needle in the haystack mm -hmm. for hitting correctly that particular gene? Mm -hmm. But then, then we took our chances and I did a, a mutation breeding with chemical and physical mutations. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky to get eight uh, TGMS lines we developed and that was, uh, a very path-breaking uh, effort. And uh, it was our India's first uh, approach where we could develop uh, our own TGMS line uh, mm -hmm. in Indica background for the first time. And this uh, triggered the two-line hybridized research in India. And for which I was awarded the Jawaharlal Nehru Award uh, for outstanding PhD thesis. And then uh, I joined uh, Dr. S.K. Raina for my, uh, uh, who was also, uh, one of very great scientists on double haploids at that time. And he's still there uh, in uh, some private sector. And uh, the, the double haploid uh, breeding approach uh, was a very good approach by which you can quickly fix the uh, any kind of material uh, segregating and uh, reach the farmers much faster. Mm -hmm. So this uh, learning from him uh, helped me to uh, uh, speed up much of the breeding activities uh, in the later part when I was trying to fix material. Okay. Coming to, uh, then I came to, uh, I was selected for the uh, two-line hybridized uh, uh, postdoc at ERI under Dr. Virmani. And Virmani is one of the uh, stalwarts for hybridized, who was the first two uh, ERI scientists who brought this technology to Asia and shared uh, much of the materials uh, initially from uh, ERI's uh, germ plasm to uh, the uh, members in, in different parts of the world. And uh, IRI could uh, uh, perform, promote uh, hybridized technology outside China in Asia specifically. And much of the work uh, credit goes to Dr. Virmani with whom I had a good association with him. 
uh, for a, uh, uh, in that time uh, when I was working for Tulane. And then I moved on uh, from there to uh, serve the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University at uh, Agriculture College and Research Institute at uh, Trichy, uh, where I was trying to do uh, salt tolerant hybrids, uh, which were uh, never in, we never thought of uh, developing stress tolerant hybrids at that early. You imagine uh, sometime in 95, uh, we had an ICR project grant from ad hoc project uh, mm -hmm. and also NATP project also we got and uh, uh, on teak two line hybridized project as well. So these projects uh, uh, helped me to develop the first uh, salt tolerant hybrid, especially sodic city tolerant hybrid, CORH2 uh, from Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, uh, which did very well in the sodic conditions where the pH is more than nine. And this hybrid did very well, more than 1.5 tons of the best uh, Czech hybrid uh, inbreds at that time. And then this journey from there, I came to, uh, 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 I was, uh, uh, after serving five years there, I came back to Erie again for a second round of postdoc uh, under the Rockefeller Foundation uh, granted uh, project where uh, I could uh, work with a very uh, lead scientist, uh, a genome uh, a specialist at that time was Dr. Zikang Li and he's uh, also was the GSR project leader as, uh, from Chinese Academy of Agriculture Sciences. And uh, he was one of the very lead scientists with whom I had the opportunity to work with him as a postdoc in 2000 to 2003 as a project scientist at Erie. And that is where I learned, I was the first uh, generation of the molecular breeders uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, where, which invested on molecular breeders at that time. At that time, the technology was mostly on the SSR markers, uh, uh, moving away from the RAPD markers and all those markers and came to SSR. SSR was considered as uh, the best uh, marker at that moment. And everybody working like uh, day and night, I remember still uh, many people uh, working uh, uh, like uh, shifts, night shift and day shift in the marker lab in Erie. And uh, this was a very exciting site, more than 15 postdocs in, uh, in that lab uh, called Genome uh, Mapping Lab, GML, it was popularly called. And uh, uh, then, the, then I, after this uh, project scientist, I moved to a place uh, where I was uh, under IRI Iran project. Uh, I moved to Iran for six years to lead their uh, molecular breeding and the hybrid program there. And I developed uh, and helped in the development and deployment of uh, Bahar one, which is uh, one of the very high yielding hybrids uh, using the IRI germplasm. And uh, later also we developed about six hybrids, uh, uh, very high yielding hybrids for this country. And then uh, uh, I came to IRI as the GSR project scientist, uh, uh, leading the GSR project at IRI in 2009. Uh, uh, and this uh, uh, was at a time when uh, this uh, whole thing uh, was uh, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and ERI was a sub grantee of Chinese Academy of Agriculture Sciences. And we were entrusted to develop uh, and breed uh, materials in the tropical context. Uh, whereas China is in temperate conditions and it, uh, it was a big challenge to uh, adapt the materials uh, coming from there. So we had to do a whole fledged, a full fledged breeding at ERI uh, to acclimatize and completely tropicalize the materials. And that's how the GSR breeding strategy evolved. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it helped us to map many of the traits related to uh, many abiotic stresses. And that's this 10 year period from 2009 to 2019 mm -hmm. was the most glorious period for me in my career where I could, uh, uh, but my dream was fulfilled when I joined ERI, uh, to be honest uh, with you all that. It was like uh, joining ERI was something like uh, like a, something like a dream come true for a kid when I was a, a, a just thinking of just going to Punjab Agriculture University and then from IRA and then coming to IRI and then becoming a scientist at IRI uh, was really a very pleasant moment for me. And uh, I really, I, I feel uh, uh, that uh, the, the opportunity that IRI gave me to uh, unleash my potential uh, is uh, very much uh, acknowledged. And I, I feel for all youngsters that they should always aspire to come to Erie and uh, see, get connected with us. Uh, this is a very good opportunity for everyone. So uh, I could release about 
28 varieties directly bred by me in less than seven to eight years and reaching 2.7 million hectares and uh, almost uh, 2.2 million farmers touched. 110 of these materials are in the pipeline in different countries to be released. So how productive you can be beyond this, I, I don't realize. And now uh, with the hybrids that we are developing, we have hundreds of hybrids in the pipeline that will hit the uh, commercialization wing very soon. And uh, this is uh, what is the potential uh, of these materials will be unleashed as we go along. So uh, this is where uh, my journey uh, uh, of uh, leading the hybridized program at DIRI, where we uh, revitalized the hybridized development consortium. And today we have 88 members from public and private sector. And uh, this uh, is a very good platform where uh, the public and private sectors come together and learn a lot of uh, uh, things where we share our materials with this, uh, sec this platform. And we get uh, nominal fees from them and uh, a nominal uh, uh, licensing fees that goes back into research again of IRI's uh, mandate to serve the poor farmers in the world to reduce the costs and all those things. I think uh, I, I don't want to extend more than this. I think this is where uh, the journey ends and it's still very bright for me to uh, move along and uh, uh, some other time I will tell you the rest part of the story as we go along. Thank sure, you. Sir. Sir, um, how important a role uh, will hybrid rice play in feeding the billions in the future? You see, the, the hybrid rice is such a wonderful technology. Uh, uh, it's, it, you have to understand the core of the uh, issue here. What is your parents is what is your F1. Hmm. If you design your parents uh, according to the requirements of the market segments, and definitely the hybrids will perform the same way. And if you have very good system of uh, market segmentation and understanding market requirements and breeding the right parental lines for different, definitely the hybrids can give 25 to 30% yield. Now 25 to 30% yield means 25 to 30% uh, resources you are saving. Like suppose you have 100 hectares of land uh, of uh, inbreds, and I want to put uh, in terms of production, if I just have to use hybrids, I will get it done in 70 hectares, the same yield. Hmm. So 30 hectares is saved, in a, uh, just to understand uh, in a layman's language that 30, per 30 hectares of uh, inputs is saved, 30% of the labor is saved, 30% of the uh, uh, inputs that is very costly these days are being saved. So hybrid technology uh, does so much in that front. Then you have the uh, the second layer of uh, the uh, the it gives employment generation to the industry. It also uh, helps the farmers to come out of this uh, uh, the the so-called uh, one ton uh, uh, means the marginal advantages that they get from inbred technologies. Uh, of course, inbred technology is important, but uh, it has to be utilized in places where the the manifestation of the heterosis is maximized where you get 25 to 30%, definitely one should exploit. So when you translate this into a larger uh, area, now 8 million hectares outside China is hybridized. If we can touch 15 million hectares in the next 10 years, I'm sure that we can meet the challenge of 2050 to uh, feed globally, especially who are depending on rice as their staple diet. I think I will uh, stop here. Uh, uh, sir, uh, along with uh, food security, what are your thoughts on nutritional security of rice? Yeah, this is a very important topic. I think uh, it's a very important uh, thing that the second dimension of food security has to go along with uh, the nutritional security. And uh, I also mentioned in my uh, first slide, even I uh, mentioned that to, uh, for the viewers, that this uh, nutritional security is so vital that it's the the, it is not just food security is just not uh, just solving the hunger, but the uh, hidden hunger is solved by the nutritional security. There are a lot of hidden hunger in terms of zinc requirements, dietary requirements of iron, zinc, and many other uh, elements that is uh, missing in many of our uh, uh, diets. And by putting these things in uh, right perspective and uh, making a mainstreaming of uh, breeding methodologies by which we incorporate zinc and iron uh, into our all breeding pipelines, uh, this can be resolved and uh, very easily it can be done. It's just some few major genes that is required to be brought into the uh, breeding pipelines. 
uh, where we can use them even in the forward breeding approach. One or two markers for that to, to select automatically those uh, materials and we can forward it and very easily it can be done. And anybody can do it. It's not uh, uh, some lead institution doing it. Any breeder uh, with that uh, mindset should be able to involve uh, the zinc and iron to be incorporated in their breeding programs. Uh, but one thing, uh, one caution here is one has to be very careful when you are using this type of heavy metals like uh, zinc specifically, they have a lot of interaction with uh, other heavy metals as well. So uh, in places where uh, arsenic and uh, cadmium, they have huge interactions and interplays between these type of uh, heavy metals. So one should not uh, put them, their uptake mechanisms are similar. So one has to be very careful in breeding uh, zinc rich uh, materials, but uh, not to be deployed in places where arsenic is a problem. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, deployment has to be very careful. So therefore the market segment analysis is very important before deployment strategy is now. So this is the future, uh, uh, very important for uh, nutritional security, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, what new tools and techniques will be important for rice breeding in the future? I think uh, this is a very uh, important, we are evolving actually uh, from simple marker estate breeding in the past uh, and simple breeding marker estate was considered as a big uh, tool at that time. And then we came on to uh, the, uh, the whole genome sequences were done. And now uh, when all the molecular markers and high density maps are available, we know more uh, information on the genotype of the materials that we are breeding. We can play with these, uh, uh, the whole genome sequences to our uh, advantage uh, where we can uh, easily pull them, pyramid them uh, uh, and do many things, uh, including the genomic selection nowadays is the buzzword. I, I think uh, genomic selection by using elite by elite founder lines uh, certainly should uh, help in uh, advancing the uh, genetic gains. Uh, much rapidly, but uh, the the for the youngsters, I see that this uh, the new tools uh, mostly related to computers and uh, related to gene sequencing should not tie them up with the computers and uh, servers and running after the data, but without looking at the plants in the field. Uh, my breeding always came from the field evaluation and selection, and then uh, fully and. Uh, uh, enforced with uh, the genomic knowledge of the materials and their uh, how they move in the structure and then analyzed uh, them and uh, using de design QTL pyramiding. So the GSR breeding technology, the design QTL pyramiding approaches and uh, the rapid uh, generation cycles to uh, maximize your genetic gains. We call nowadays speed breeding and a lot of good publications are there where you can do uh, six seasons in a year in barley and other crops. Uh, for rice still it is uh, three and a half crops you can take uh, in a year, but uh, that, that's a challenge. But this can really rapidly, you can advance your generations and genetic gains can be maximized. Uh, and above that, if you use some of the best uh, breeding strategies like genomic selection, uh, GSR breeding strategies, design QTL pyramiding, I think these can do wonders for any breeding program. And this can be extended to not only rice, any crop, uh, don't get restricted. This is this is open to any crop, and these are uh, most of the crops are being used uh, by our sister uh, CG centers as well. Okay, sir. So, uh, sir, uh, now uh, we'll conclude with uh, one last question. Uh, what would your words of advice be to the young research fellows out there? I think uh, uh, the words of advice. I am not in a position to give advice to anyone, but uh, some of the youngsters, I think. Uh, uh, what I would suggest them is there is no, uh, no replacement to hard work. No matter uh, you do anything, you have to put uh, all your dedication, your efforts, and these are proven pathways already. It's not that uh, we are going for the first time learning something. Uh, you have to use the proven pathways of people who have experienced, and I'm telling you that it was not an easy journey for me to reach here. And if you have to do, it was sheer hard work, hard work, hard work. And, uh, and true dedication to see that your materials reach the farmers. So there should be some kind of a driving force or passion to drive you exactly. So sometimes this passion drives you to be dedicated and you always remember that, look at that uh, poor farmer there in somewhere your materials will be utilized. Can that bring spines to his faces? Uh, that is what drives me personally. 
and that uh, motivates me every day. Okay, somebody is using my material and trying to benefit by even half a ton uh, in the best conditions. It's good that that uh, gives a lot of rewarding, self-rewarding yourself that uh, somebody is benefited out of it. And then uh, the apart from this, uh, the uh, some of the uh, students they have to understand that it's not. Uh, 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 they have to put uh, very dedicated efforts uh, uh, to uh, uh, to get to the bottom of it, basically. Like you should be passionate, you should have inquisitive mindset, uh, you should try to go to the bottom of everything, not just look at the top and just do something mm -hmm. and uh, superficially touch it, but get to the bottom of it. And this is very important for youngsters, especially in the jet set age of modern computers and uh, gadgets and uh, media and all those things. So they get often diverted. Uh, so uh, they should go deeper. A deeper dive is very essential for science. And unless you get satisfied personally, I don't think no better rewarding than your self-satisfaction and mm -hmm. what you're doing at the end of the day. I think uh, I, I, I like to just uh, uh, put this uh, as a prick to the, uh, the budding scientists so, so that they start get started right away. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we will now go back to Shubal. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I just uh, wanted to show you our uh, today's our responses because it's very hard to uh, calculate the viewers. It's, it's easy to calculate that we got within uh, four seconds, 500 attendees in the Zoom box. And I noted about 955 in uh, YouTube, but it is varied. Uh, so the best way, how I we understand that, what is the today's attendees, I want to share the screen to you. And this is ongoing. We got 1,928 responses. And from these countries, we got 1,674 responses from India, from Nepal, Philippines, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, China, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Australia, Cambodia, Egypt, Iraq, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Vietnam, Berlin, Benin, Bhutan, Ghana, Ireland, Kenya, Mexico, Oman, Peru, Shadan, Zimbabwe, and many more. So uh, I think uh, uh, it, it is the reward and it is the satisfaction um, to you and uh, uh, for us also that so many, so many people are viewing uh, viewing today's talk and so many questions. I, I, I don't know. There is a lot of questions, so many uh, private sectors, company from Pakistan, they are, they are going to approach with you about your work. And I think uh, this, uh, this uh, work, uh, this webinar is fruitful, fruitful to me. I am expecting such, such responses and I'm very thankful to I you. Think, uh, I think uh, one should congratulate you and your team actually for this <laughs> wonderful. Uh, I'm very delighted to uh, that uh, that so many people listen to uh, my talk and uh, certainly it's a very humble request that uh, I will try to answer many of these questions uh, at a later date. If I get their email IDs or something, I can respond to them as well. Uh, uh, at least uh, the, uh, some of these questions, if you can post me back, Okay. Uh, at TD, we can uh, put a staff for uh, sorting out these questions and okay. we can send back as uh, feedback to you, okay. which you can post back into your uh, YouTube or somewhere. So uh, that no, uh, I don't want uh, my hmm. the questions get lost uh, uh, somewhere okay. uh, in this uh, huge uh, uh, responses that came. Certainly, we'll try to respond to every question and uh, put it in a YouTube section, uh, which I will share with Shubo later on. Uh, I, I promise that. Yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, we, yeah, and I also thank uh, all the viewers uh, for patiently bearing with me. Uh, sometimes uh, I get excited and I, I think I didn't cross the time, but uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, my presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. And we have the all the uh, we have the feedback form and all the email address of the actual attendees, so we can forward your answer to them any any point of time in the future. And we uh, we are going to share without their email ad disclosing their email address and phone number. We are going to share their institute, their uh, profession, and their name in our website, and we allot okay. their certificate number. So I sure, also sure. share you the link uh, to tonight. You can see the actual uh, professions wise everything. So sure. it's so wonderful being uh, with you. Uh, I, I I really I don't expect that you you uh, you agree to deliver a talk, but it motivates me a lot. Even your presence give me so many. Uh, uh, positive positivity for your talks that I can uh, move forward. We can uh, all together, it, it is for the benefit of plant science and we are all our plant loving people. So yeah. it is uh, thankful and thanks from my team and from sure. my. Yeah, from my side and Liri's side, uh, I think uh, I'd like to thank uh, the team uh, BioEngine uh, and the panelists out here. Uh, they are doing a wonderful job, and uh, I'm sure uh, this uh, this platform will grow uh, to strength and uh, with time. And uh, keep doing this uh, effort, and uh, certainly uh, there will be more instances that more uh, learned people will come and talk in your platform, and uh, it would encourage uh, science to progress. Uh, this is exactly what IRI is all about. IRI wants to share knowledge with its partners and. Uh, people who look towards ERI, they are welcome to ERI and uh, look at our website and look at our thing and uh, get connected with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We have some few minutes we wanted to share with our viewers. You you can, sir, you leave the meeting. You, uh, you, you can leave the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. Now I hand it over to Shoma give some instruction regarding the certificates because today we got so many uh, new viewers also. So it's maybe they are uh, answers to how to get the certificate and what what is the next. Today we got so many uh, suggestions of future topic. I'm assuring all of you, we try, we try our best, but we need the speaker also. Those are the expert on that topic. I jot down and uh, with the help of our two uh, volunteers. Uh, so we, we, we uh, try to uh, communicate a respected uh, expert on that field, if it is possible, definitely in near future, it will be available. And we, we are happy to host those topic and those speaker in this platform. We already set and start the registration for the webinar in August. There are four webinars because we uh, we try to lower down the number of webinars because in July we uh, we are arranged eleven webinars. So in future we try to four two to four webinars in a month, which gives us the time to tell giving the certificate to inquiries to arrange. And we also have our own work. Uh, we are all a researcher and active researcher. So we need some time to our own work also. So hope you guys are understand that uh, so many webinars is not possible, but uh, we uh, planned in such a way that uh, many talks can possible. And uh, many of you are learn and I also very interested in, in this talk also in, this, in the future talks. Shoma will help to understand our future talks and, and uh, available uh, options uh, you know, which we keep on the, the bioengine to Shoma. Okay, I'll share my screen now. Okay. Is it visible? Okay. Wait. Okay. This is the first one. 
this is it okay <clears throat> so you can see that there is the password for today's um feedback form uh, which is uh, well, you need it for the certificates regarding the certificates you can apply for the certificate for a certificate for uh, attendance for today's webinar we give out certificates of attendance and if you have attended the webinar you can apply for the certificate all you need to do is you need to click on the feedback link which is uh, you can see it in the chat box in zoom and youtube if you don't find the feedback link you can also go to our website there is the uh, the feedback link is also present there uh, you will need the password which is a uh, this is the password on the screen and also uh, it is there on in the chat box just get the password because uh, there is a place when you, you need to type the password in the feedback form you fill out the feedback from uh, form and then you save a copy for uh, of the google response sheet because you may need it later you after filling out the form you will find that uh, you can save a response sheet okay uh, another thing i want to say is that uh, you only have 2 hours time uh, for this uh, filling out of the form um, the the link will be active till 2:10 uh, indian standard time uh, so within 2 hours it will close also um regarding the certificates we are not sending the certificates individually by email so what we are doing is uh, we uh, we take two days uh, for this to uh, for to make this happen uh, we are uh, receiving all the applications from you through the feedback form after we receive all the applications we will make a list with a file number so you get this list from our website go to our website home page scroll down and you will find the all the previous webinars have been listed there with the name, name of the topic you click on the topic name it is a hyperlink you click on the topic name and you will see that an excel sheet opens up you will find all the attendees uh, the list of all the attendees who attended today's webinar you can find that the, there's a name and there's a file number so you click uh, you find out your name you, it's is all arranged alphabetically you find out your name and you will be allotted a file number then you uh, go back to the home page and then you see that then uh, um, that is written the uh, title of the webinar there is uh, a certificate is written in hyperlink you click on the certificate hyperlink and you will go straight into the google drive folder we have shared the certificate folder the google drive folder you get in the folder and give it some time to load because it is a big folder so it will uh, take some time to load and you also you need a good internet uh, speed uh, then you can see that all the pdfs are uh, pdfs are there with the file numbers so you have your file number and you then you download your pdf certificate that's very easy and also uh, you don't have to wait for anybody you just have to wait for two days after every webinar so that we can do this we can make the certificates and make the sheet and put it in the drive and share the link okay so we need two days for this because uh, many of people are many people are asking uh, right after the webinar or today evening they are asking where is my certificate so we need two days please give us two days time for this go to our website after two days and you will find that the title name and the certificate link is there click on the title name get your pdf file number click on the certificate link download your certificate okay next uh, this is uh, our uh, next webinar it is on 24th july uh, the speaker is dr raviraj banakar he recently joined avastagen and he came back to india from university of minnesota usa recently and joined avastagen he will be talking on the topic crispr cas precision genome engineering the registrations have been open for a long time now and are still open please register for this uh, you can visit our website all the everything every webinar details are there of all the upcoming webinars you will find the detail about this webinar also there you can click on the registration link and register for this webinar okay and these are the uh, webinars in the month of august 
in the, for the month of august we are we have arranged four webinars one is uh, the first one is on 6th august then 11th august then 17th august then on 24th august you can find all the details on our website and the registration links are also open you can go in and register okay uh, while you are registering or uh, while you are filling out any type of form registration form or form of certificate application you are inputting some data like your name your email address uh, i just want to uh, request some of you that uh, some of you mistype your email address so please see that you have typed in your email address correctly because if you type it incorrectly then you will not receive any mail from our end because of the wrong email address okay so please uh, check that your email address is correct uh, i mean i have to check like for today's regis, uh, registration uh, there were almost 5000 uh, over 5000 uh, registrations i had to go through each and every one of them to and one other thing i um, i wanted to say is that uh, please don't share your email address with anyone while registering one name one email address okay if one person if there are two people with the same email address um we i don't know how we are we will sort it out i mean uh, it will be it will it is not good because it's not fair either because one person can uh, apply for so many uncountable uncountable number of people so no that is not happening here one person will have one email address only one email address okay don't share with anyone for the purpose of registration you make your own email address okay uh, regarding the name on the certificate um, uh, write in your name correctly first of all type it correctly because i have been receiving mistakes on your name and then you are requesting by mail that please i have made a mistake in typing my name or i have forgotten to write my middle name please uh, write in my name correctly so uh, for so many people correcting their uh, names will be very difficult for us please uh, please uh, write it correctly also don't put in your designation in your certificate application form just write in your name okay that's it from me um, that's all i had to say uh, see you again on 24th july for the next webinar uh, thank you okay stop screen sharing how do i stop the screen sharing thank you shuma Okay, wait. Uh, now we are we are going uh, at the end of uh, today's webinar. Uh, I'm personally request all of you because all the email uh, I I received and uh, actually I uh, give them the feedback and I feel very unhappy when I not giving the answer because I like to give the answer of uh, your email, but uh, but it is very hectic. hectic uh, to unnecessary email and emailing me because our rules is rules and we we can't change the rules because uh, it is a new platform and rules make us the better so uh, asking for the password asking for the feedback link after the end of this webinar is not going to be answered your internet problem your locality your personal reason is not going to be entertained and we are not giving you such opportunity and we are not giving you the feedback link and password letter that 220 or just ending the webinar session you have to come in the live webinar listen learn because it's all free but we also organized it because we can't give the uh, password email address before or after the webinar so i am requesting all of you don't mail us on such issues or we are not going to answer your mail second is when i upload the certificate i i 
carefully check all the certificates are there or not because when i upload it automatically google drive folder shows me that this number of certificate has been uploaded so there is no ambiguity there is no confusion that whether certificate is are there or not if it is not in there check it check check uh, check uh, uh, in uh, with a high internet speed so i think uh, all the certificate are there i'm after assuring i shared the drive so there is no chance that your certificate is not there it will be happen that your your uh, name is not on the list because you have not submitted your feedback because it's a auto generated list uh, it is auto generated list and it's automatically shorted out by the google forms so if you able to submit your feedback whatever the reason if you not able to submit your feedback whatever the reason you will not get the certificate so if you submitted your feedback form you will get the certificate but we need to scrutiny your form because we wanted to your name not your designation not your institute and not your profession current profession because these are the different form so many people are put their name with their designation we we in the certificate application form because in every certificate i issued my name is mentioned there and it's my responsibility to check all the certificate before i'm going to issue them so i need this good time we need two days after two days you come and collect your certificate from our website if you're not getting your certificate but your name is on the list check multiple time with high speed internet using the computer using the google chrome logging into the google drive or google account it has to be there don't email us on that basis if your name not in the list this is the reason that you not giving the feedback form and we can't include your name after 2:20 2:10 pm of today's webinar so best of luck do your do your uh, feedback and please come at early to listen the talk some guys have come into at the end why got just a request feedback link please what the meaning of that the webinar is is end it it's and now somebody asking for what is the link please don't ask such type of link. don't ask such don't uh, don't what i say don't it's not a good approach to listen that type of webinar our all webinar i think we give enough time to listen and learn not that 20 minutes or 25 minutes where uh, the 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 webinar is uh, for a good time good explanation you got so it's a good learning process i also learn from this webinar a lot so this is the end of today's webinar as i got the request i just put the last time today's password and the link but please come at 11 we start at the sharp time come at the 11 listen for something from our webinar series see you guys in 24 there is a talk on crispr thank you and all the related information you guys are able to find it from our website as our website is not built yet but you can go for bioengine.com there is a mention a link there is our alternative google slides drive so i suggest if you have any question any query mail us but uh is a very easy process to listen bioengine webinar and apply the speed web form thank you thank you everyone i am going to stop this webinar and this video will be available very soon
due to back to back webinar i'm unable to put all the videos but uh, i think within two days i'll able to put all the videos in that our youtube channel please subscribe our youtube channel it will help us to communicate to you in a better way thank you